Hey, what's up everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we'll be doing another Solving Real World Data Science Problems project walkthrough. And if you're unfamiliar with this video format, basically we walk through a Python project and at various points in the video, we pause and I present a task for you to try out on your own. And either when you solve the task or if you can't figure it out and need to see how I would approach it, then you can resume the video and the project kind of continues. So we have some real world tasks for you to try out as we kind of walk through this full project. And so today we'll be doing some historical document analysis using large language models and natural language processing techniques. And the context of these documents is that we have a ton of historical documents from post-American Civil War. So these documents are specifically from the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. This is also often just called Freedmen's Bureau for short. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was set up at the end of the Civil War or after the Civil War to help aid formerly enslaved individuals uh, during the Reconstruction era. So, you know, help provide school, housing, jobs, etc. And so we have documents from the various roles of the Bureau. Our goal is to see if we can analyze and find any sort of meaningful insights from these documents. And so one thing that's super exciting about this project is that when I say this is real world, I really mean real world. This is an actual freelance project that I worked on, that I got paid to work on, um, that I did on Upwork. So it's super cool to be able to present some of this in video form to all of you. So as part of this project, there's a corresponding Kaggle data set, and I'll link that in the description of this video. I encourage you to check this out and contribute notebooks with any of your research findings to help further move forward this research. And this has all of the information you'll probably need on the data set and the contents of the data set. Uh, very well documented. Uh, quick shout out to Trent Self who helped put together and document this Kaggle data set. But one thing I specifically want to call out is the website that's corresponding to the research and the ongoing insights that have come out of the research. So we can go to freedmansbureau.info, also linked in the description. And this has you know, some more background and also some insights that have come so far from analyzing these historical documents. Um, one thing that might be helpful for all of you as you start diving into this data is that there's specific categories uh, and some insights from specific sets of these documents. So we'll be working specifically on the indentures of apprenticeship documents in this video. So to get started, you can either go ahead and click New Notebook in Kaggle, or you can download the clone the repo that's on GitHub. Everything is going to be linked in the uh, description of this video but I'll start on Kaggle. I'll probably bounce a little bit back and forth because certain things I think we can only really do locally and certain things will be better to do in Kaggle. But I'll go ahead and create a new notebook. I'll just call this like research findings or something like that. And first thing you'll wanna do is go ahead and run this cell which will load in all the data. What the heck is corgi mode? Oh wow, there's a corgi running across the screen. That's cool. Didn't know about that. Can I toggle kitty mode and corgi mode? Wow, it's fascinating. Okay, cool. So we have all of these documents and to not be too distracting, I'm gonna untoggle Corgi and kitty mode. We have all these documents, so the first thing you'll want to be able to do is just make sure you can read these documents. So we'll do a quick df equals pd.read csv, and we'll do slash Kaggle. We can just copy one of these links. And we'll be specifically looking at contract records in this tutorial, so let's go ahead and do that. And I will also do df.head. Cool, we can see what we have there, that's good. So we've loaded in our first CSV file. But 
What we're actually going to want to do here for task number zero, I'm going to say, because this is kind of like before we're actually getting into the video. Task number zero is just to configure a large language model to use with Python. We're going to do this in two different ways because I want to make this as accessible as possible to all of you. So one is going to be using the OpenAI API, and number two is going to be using Olama to run Llama2 locally. So that was a little bit of a mouthful, but one is using an open AI and one is using an open source model. So use whatever makes sense to you. You're going to have better performance with the open AI models probably, but you won't be cost, you won't be charged anything with Llama 2. And so our specific task I'm going to say is kind of how you complete this is generate a story about a data scientist finding all sorts of cool things in historical documents. So this is what you're going to be prompting the LLM to do to complete task number zero. Feel free to pause the video, try to configure this on your own, and resume when you want to see how I would go about doing it. All right, so how would we go ahead and configure an LLM? Well, as I said, we're going to want to use OpenAI. So what you want to do if you don't have an account already is Go to platform.openai.com. You might have to sign in or create an account if you haven't already. Once you're logged in to platform.openai.com slash doc slash overview, you're going to want to click on this API keys option. You're going to want to create a new secret key. And I'll just call this YouTube tutorial. Copy this. And you're going to want to go back to Kaggle, or if you're using a local notebook, that will work too. And one thing that I'll want to do is add a secret because I don't want this just stored in my notebook. So I'm going to call this uh, OpenAI key value. I'll blur this out if I need to. Save that. Perfect. And now I can go ahead and how do we access those secrets? I've listed a link in the GitHub readme. So to access those with Kaggle, you can do this code here. And we'll try that. Our secret label was OpenAI key. And I'll just print the first three values of this just so you can see if it loaded in properly. Cool. So we see we have a secret key there. It's loaded in. And then what we need to do is we can go to the open AI API set API key. Install Python. OK, so these docs will probably be helpful. I'll add them to the readme on GitHub. Okay, set up your API key. And we can do something like this. Because I don't think we actually are going to use environment variables. So we can go ahead and how do they do that? Do they import OpenAI from OpenAI, import OpenAI? We can try that too. And I think by default, Kaggle already has OpenAI, so it's good to know. And then what was the latter half of that? We want the client code here. And I do command um, forward slash to uncomment multiple lines. So we don't need an environment variable here. What we actually need is that secret value. And run that. No. OK. 
No module named OpenAI. If you run into this, uh, what you can do is you can run actual pip commands via the terminal by doing pip install OpenAI. So you do an explanation point that should install your library in, in the notebook. There might be other ways here too in Kaggle, but this is just what I do if I'm in a Jupyter Notebook already. Cool, we have that. Okay, let's run this again. Perfect. And now our goal is ultimately to generate a story about a data scientist finding all sorts of cool things in historical documents. So how can we do that? This looks like some nice code to just copy and paste. We'll do it on the next cell. You are a creative genius able to write short stories with a bunch of humor. Okay, that's our system message. System message basically defines how this chat client will operate throughout the duration of a conversation. So let's say you want it to, it to always translate whatever was input into Spanish, you would tell it to do that as the system role, because then every user message that comes after, it will know to generate an assistant message that's translating it into that other language. So this is kind of like, if you want it to follow a rule the whole time, use the system message to do that. And here, uh, if we want to just do the task, create a short, fun story about a data scientist that makes here a huge discovery when analyzing historical documents. Okay, I'm gonna run this. No. Okay. I think we can also, one thing that's helpful is I think you can do, we're gonna try something real quick. I think if we do import OpenAI and then OpenAI dot set environment, set OpenAI key for duration of program. I'm gonna just look up something like OpenAI dot API key. Okay, I think we can do this. Let's try. Let's see if it works now, the code. No. I mean, I guess I don't have to do client again. We can, we already have that. So if I run this, run this, let's see if it generates our story. No, what happened? We exceeded our current quota. Okay. This is something good to know, and this is part of the reason why it's frustrating sometimes to try to use the OpenAI stuff. So. I think that you get three requests per minute. So honestly, what we'll find is if I run this again in a second, 
it'll be fine. But this is gonna be really tough for like a production grade project like we're working on. So what we're gonna wanna do here is I think going to settings, billing, um, add payment, let's see. I think Go into usage, increase limit. Must be on a paid plan to manage uses limits. So everyone, do what you're most comfortable with. If it's not a big deal to do something like this uh, and buy credits, go ahead and do it. And that probably will make your life easier throughout the video. But also note that we'll show how to use open source so you don't have to pay anything. I just I want to make this as realistic as possible and kind of in the real world right now, a lot of people are doing this and, and, and buying credits. So I'm going to add $20 to start. Um, I'm not going to automatically recharge. Maybe I'll add 25 to start. Not going to reach. No, I don't want to recharge. Let's start there. Confirm payment. And so all you had to do was five dollars, and honestly, that will probably get you a long way. I'm just covering myself a little bit here. But what we now see is in our um, usage, in our limits. In our rate limits, we have a lot more requests we can work with. So now we're usage tier one. You can look at um, OpenAI rate limits. And we see that, yeah, you only get three requests per minute in the free tier. But if you go to tier one, then you get way more requests. So something interesting to know. Let's go back to Kaggle. I'm gonna run this again, run this. Come on, what's our story? Oh, what happened this time? We definitely have increased our quota. How long for quota to update OpenAI API? What we might try real quick is just creating another API key. I'm gonna call this YouTube tutorial new. Create secret key. This should have much more, you know, it should be an updated information. So hopefully it, uh, I'll call this OpenAI API key, paste that new value, save, done. API key, run that. Now let's see what happens. Come on. You know that we have an increased quota. Don't, don't, don't do this to me. There we go, cool. So created a new API key, and we now have an answer, but I'm gonna make this a little easier to read. I'm gonna grab specifically the content out of this. Run this. Oh no, I'm gonna get a, create a new one. <laughs> Maybe I move this to the next cell. Okay, once upon a time, you can read through this if you want. Once 
Wow, long forgotten civilization. That'd be awesome if that's what we discovered. I don't know if it's gonna happen though, but cool. Awesome, so now we have OpenAI working. Okay, now let's say you didn't want to do the old um, OpenAI route, you just don't wanna deal with it, you wanna use open source. Let's show how we can do that too. So in this case, because I don't think we can get this to run in Kaggle, maybe I'm wrong. If you know a way to do this in Kaggle with Olama, drop a comment down below. But basically there's this awesome new I don't know what you call it, framework. I guess we can look at their documentation to see what they call themselves. This new platform, Olama. Let's see what they call themselves. That basically really makes it easy to run large language models locally. So there's some downloads for Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, I'm on Mac right now, so I'm gonna download this. And basically, once you download it, once you have it set up, you know, you've refreshed your terminal and everything, you can open up a terminal window and you can do Olama run, and then there's a bunch of different models you can run. So specifically, I think the best option is probably the Llama 2. This should be accessible to most people. Um, note that to run the seven uh, billion parameter models, you should have eight gigabytes of RAM on your machine. So that's kind of a minimum requirement here. 16 gig to run 13 billion miles, et cetera. <laughs> We'll just do Llama 2 because that will be most accessible to everyone. Uh, you know, this is a trade-off here. It's like you have to use more of your machine to run these large language models locally versus you have to maybe pay a little money to use OpenAI API. So here's the trade-offs that we deal with in data science. But you can run a Llama, run a Llama 2. And basically, once you have that up and running, you can do something like, hello there. And it's as simple as that. And one thing that's super cool though is that this is now accessible via your Python code. So if you look into Olama Python, and you can do a pip install Olama, but basically what we can do is if you clone the repository of code that is linked in the video description, so that's gonna be at github.com slash keithgalley slash historical docs analysis, you can clone this repo and then all the libraries that we'll need to use are in the requirements.txt file. And so this is a nice little trick in the, in the Python world. You can do pip3 or pip, whatever works for you. Install dash r and you can install all of the requirements we'll need for this video. So I'll do that. So that will install the Olama library. But now, once you've done that, or you could have just simply also done like pip3 install Olama. We'll see that we already have it. We are gonna wanna import that. You probably would also wanna like import OpenAI. We'll, we'll tweak these imports. But if we go to their documentation on the Python Olama, we see Olama Python. And then what I recommend is just go ahead and like copy um, some of this code and paste this in one of these cells down below. See if this works. It's a little bit slower because we're running it locally, but it answers that question. But that was not the goal of task number zero. The goal of task number zero was, please write me a short story about a data scientist that makes a huge discovery when analyzing historical documents. Make it kind of funny. Why not? It's gotta, we, gotta, we gotta laugh. Okay, let's see what it generates. Run that. Run that. The Great Document Dumpster Fire. 
Jeez, okay. I'm going to zoom out so you can read this. Oh, God, that's... How do I make this accessible to everyone to read? Okay, copy this. I'm just going to open like a sticky note. I'm just going to paste it in a sticky note, okay? Oh, man, that's hard to read. That's even harder to read. How do I make the text... Uh, I want it black. I just want it black. There we go. Okay. Feel free to pause the video if you want to read the story. <laughs> wow, this is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> like the time Sir Lancelot accidentally donned a unicorn costume to a royal banquet, thinking it was a fashion. Uh, it's kind of a fashion statement. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. <laughs> I'm pleasantly surprised. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm happy about that. And that was an open source model, free of charge, Llama two, cool stuff. Thanks, Meta. Um, how do I close? No, what the heck? How do I deal with these sticky notes? Okay, cool. So that's us running it with Olama. All right, awesome. We've now run code with OpenAI and Olama, a you know API endpoint and a open source one. Uh, you can expand, you know, play around with different open source models here. You also could play around with different paid um, API models. One that I've tried is Coheres. You could also do like Google Bard, I think, has an API. Check that out. So a lot of different options here. And I think part of doing this type of work is figuring out what's the best option for you. Note that as we fill this out, you can always go to analysis completed to take filled in sections of task number zero, et cetera. I'll also make sure on Kaggle that there's a good notebook that you can just build off of there too. Okay, let's make some more cells real quick. You press B to make, insert a new cells below. B, 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 B. Okay. Use LM to parse simple sentence examples. All right. Now that we've done the warm up task, our first task is going to be to use LLMs to parse some simple sentence examples. So, what I mean by this is if you go into the code and you look at um, the analysis.ipython notebook file, you'll see some example inputs and outputs. And this is kind of gearing us up to get comfortable with what's actually in the contents of these historical documents. But I'll just paste them again into this notebook. And ultimately, we have sentences that are like random things, like John James agrees to pay $50 a month to R.J. Hampshire to, for work on the farm. So loosely following things you might see in some of these historical documents. But we want to use large language models to be able to parse this into meaningful information. So when we analyze these massive dumps of text, ultimately, we want to pull out names. We want to pull out numbers. We want to pull out frequencies. We want to pull out what is known as these entities so that we can then, you know, imagine we pull out all these entities for all of our documents. Now we have a nice thing to analyze on. We have, you know, concrete numbers, et cetera, that we can analyze. So we want to pull out the entities from these sentences using large language models. Okay, so I'm going to run this cell. And how would we approach this? Ultimately, the goal is to get this list of dictionaries type format that has the fields payer, recipient, amount, pay frequency, and description. That's your goal with this task, and you want to use an LLM to do it. So feel free to pause the video, try this out, and then resume when you want to see how I would approach it. If you have no idea how to approach this, feel free to watch a little bit more. I'll give a little bit more context before I get into it. 
Cool. So the way that I would think about this maybe at first, maybe using the OpenAI approach, is let's paste in exactly what we had before. So I'll just call this like parsed output. And now what I want to do is give it a good system message here. And my recommendation here is that <laughs> it's going to be tough to type in exactly what you want to right there. So I'm going to define something I call system message. So what might be our first stab at like doing this task? Well, we could say something like grab the payer recipient amount pay frequency and description from any sentence you're given. This might be the simplest first thing that we do. And so now our content is not this. It is going to be our system message. And now our user message, we could just actually pass in one of these examples. Oh, what did I do? Command C. So I could do something like this. And I could see what it creates for the output. I'll do the output down below. Let's run these two lines. So make sure this is run up top. There we go. And we'll want to do, as we saw before, choices zero message.content to make this more readable. OK, that's decent. If we just wanted to extract things out, like this would be a pretty dang good start. I think the issue comes is like this is the first output we get. What happens if we run this again? That's pretty consistent. Will it keep being consistent? It's like even just little things like this. Monthly is capitalized in this one. It's lowercase here. Amount is $50. I might just want it to say 50 and just know that it's dollars. I think it's also interesting if we pass in a different type of example. So like this one. Oh, oops. <laughs> I meant to paste it in here. That makes a lot more sense. Like, and now we have this form, like John Smith and Jane Smith for the recipient. Yes, that's correct. And it's pretty impressive seeing how well this is doing right away. But we need a little bit more of a uniform format. So what we might tell the system message to do, and one little trick is that you can do three quotation marks to make this like multi-line. Um, output the following JSON object. One little quirk, or actually, let's see. I think that brackets here are special syntax. So one little quirk is I think you need to do double. Um, double brackets for JSON. So I might do payer, lowercase, name of payer. Want to have that in string. And so you're just kind of filling in some dummy data here. Um, recipient, name, name of recipient. Amount, uh, amount in USD. And then you might like, one thing that's neat here too, 
Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll fill this out fully, and then I'll give some tricks. Frequency, you know, frequency of payment. And what was the last thing we had in the examples uh, description? What the payment was for. OK. Let's see what it does now. Run this, run. Look at that. Now we get a nice little JSON. That's pretty good. Let's keep running it. OK. We have some challenges here. Let's just keep seeing how the frequency changes. Let's see if it changes each time we run this. OK, it's per day. That's pretty good. It, it is staying pretty stable. However, one thing that one little trick is let's say you need a specific format. And sometimes, you know, it's not going to be per day. It's going to be each day. And watch how we change this. Run it. Now it's frequency each day. One trick is in this little example output, you can give it a little comment and do something like can be can only be one from daily or let's say hourly, daily, weekly. Um, monthly, yearly, or other. So now if we run this, we hope that the frequency should change to daily. And this will just make things a little bit more uniform for future analysis down the road. See, we get daily now. It's awesome. And now watch what happens if I change this back to per day and run this. We still get daily. So you can utilize little things, little tricks, like using little comments, notating your, your example output to help improve it. Um, one other trick we can do here, too, is I ideally would have this be a list of JSONs. So I want it to be a list of each person. And I might just change this like for each person that is paid in the example. If there are multiple people paid, return the list of JSONs within an array. Something like this. So you're giving more and more detail here. OK, this looks great. Awesome. It's so impressive how good this model is out of the box. Pretty dang good. One additional trick you could use if you have any issues. So if we run this again, will it do the same thing? It like This time it gave a new line, so it's still pretty dang good. Still looks pretty good. One thing that you can do as a trick, though, and this might help definitely for um, for probably the Llama 2 model, is you could actually pass in, kind of like fill this in with some examples. So user content, let's say we set this to inputs 0, and then the corresponding output would be role assistant content string outputs zero or something like that. And like now you're giving it some samples of what it you're expecting to output. And let me just real quick check what string outputs zero is. 
Yeah, that looks cool. So I would hope that this would maybe make this format here a little less of the new lines um, and more like this. I'm curious. Let's see. So basically, we just like pretended, we like just to understand what we did here, we're basically saying, oh, this was actually in your conversation. You already did this example. You already filled out and produced this output. We're like tricking the AI to think that it already knows about this in order to help us more accurately annotate the second example. So if this works successfully, I think we would hope to see a little less new line characters maybe in our output. Oh no. Oh, I should probably use commas. Look at that. Looks much closer to how we output it here and outputs zero. Pretty dang cool. And then finally, because this is a YouTube video, we only have limited time. Like, if you had all the time in the world, I would recommend like actually, you know, maybe creating a test set, a training set. In this example, I just use one of our inputs to you know, help us produce outputs. But what you might want to actually do is confirm if certain values are the same as what you expect. So what can we do? We want to actually get this to be in Python syntax, because if we try to like grab the first item from this, we're going to get an error here. So I'll just show this because it's a string right now. Actually, we'll get, I guess, a character of the string. But we want this to actually be a Python, a Python object. So try to see if you can figure out how to make this a Python object on your own and resume if you want to see how I would do it. OK, so how I would approach this is there's a library called AST that we can use. And AST has a, and that stands for, I think, abstract, abstract syntax tree, AST library Python. Let's see what it, yeah, abstract syntax tree. And it has a method that's part of it called literal eval. And we could actually pass in this to our little eval and call this like you know, actual output equals this. And the expected output equals you know, outputs one because this was this example, so that's index two, so index two. So we actually wanted outputs two as our uh, expected output. And now we could compare specific fields. So I could do like actual output zero to get the first item in that list, expected output zero. Spelled that wrong. Oh, and I want to print both of these. Print. Print a new line in between them, and then print. Run that. Cool. OK. And then you could like actually test to see if the fields were the same. This description field is going to be really hard to get that actually the same. There's no one right answer there, but there is if you define it properly, you know, a correct answer here, 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 etc. So you could actually do comparisons like and and validate that these are what they expect you expect them to be. Cool. That is showing how we can parse out some entities from using OpenAI. Now let's try the same thing using the um, Olama, Llama 2 interface. And one thing I'm going to recommend here, it's not, you don't have to do this, but I think it's worthwhile doing, and I think we'll do it 
throughout the rest of the video. Um, one library that I really like for LLM stuff is Langchain. So you can uh, look up Langchain Olama, and you can actually use Olama in Langchain. And so Langchain basically gives you all sorts of nice helper methods within with large language models. It also gives you access to things like agents and lets you chain language model commands together, which can be super, super helpful as you kind of get more into this space. So for this exercise of trying to classify the, these examples with um, Llama 2, we'll go ahead and use um, chat o Llama. So this looks pretty good. And we might want human message. We might want, I think there's a system message and then there's a AI message. So pretty similar to how we were interacting before. But we could try just copying that same exact system message from above. And I'm going to do system message. I think actually I copied the whole thing. So there we go. System message. I'm going to move this LM call just down a bit. OK. So I might now do system message equals content equals system message. And then I might pass in next the user human message. And the content would be inputs. I don't know why it's saying binputs. Inputs. Oh, I guess I accidentally typed a B there. Input zero. And let's see what it outputs. Come on. It doesn't seem exactly what we want. Maybe we accidentally added something weird here. Like it's it's outputting multiple things. Like this looks correct. It's getting thrown off by this. So I'm going to just remove this stuff real quick. I'm going to run this again. OK, sure, here is the JSON object based on the sentence you provided. <laughs> and it's great, but we only wanted the JSON object. So one cool thing that we can do, like let me say, or you can do words like important, return only the JSON and nothing else. Oh, wow, that was pretty good. Now. What we can try to do is access fields from that. So chat model response dot content, and then we'll access like the payer field. What happens if we do that? OK, so this is still a string, so we're having issues. So in addition to the literal eval, one other thing that's useful is within JSON, you can do a JSON I always forget if it's dumps or loads. It's loads in this case because we're loading a string into like a Python dictionary. Um, so we're going to try to load this in. Um, we'll call this like response dict equals this. Load that in. And then we could do response dict. And then we could grab the payer field, for example. John James, perfect. And is that correct? John James agrees, yeah, he's the payer. So let's run this again, see if it works again. Looks like it worked. However, 
What we wanted to do is actually be able to output a list because it's going to get really confused, I think, when we do this example number three, which is index two, inputs two. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, so it like tries to format things like this. What we wanted was an individual entry here. And ultimately, you're, you can make this decision on what works better for your future analysis. Ultimately, the reason we're doing this warm-up exercise is because we want to be able to make parsings like this in all of our documents that we have in this database. So you can decide what the schema is that you want to adhere to, but my gut was just to like make this a list and, and have a single entry for each person um, in it. So what I might do to help it understand this is I think it's pretty good at outputting a JSON object, but I'm going to make it results. And then I'm going to have a list in here. The list So I'm gonna like kind of give it a let it know that it might be multiple people here. I don't know why it gave me this. Note, if there are multiple people being paid, each should have a full entry in the results list. OK, let's try this. It's pretty good. Ah, it's still doing recipient with multiple names. So how can we get it to have a full entry? Well, I bet you we could trick it by passing in human, human message, which is this, and then a AI message, which is the output, the actual output. And like, obviously, we wouldn't want to like it would be cheating if we pass this in and then had it try to output inputs two again. But we'll try to have it output a similar one where there's multiple payers. So something like um, the local sports club agrees to pay $75 each to coaches Sarah Miller, Danny Glover, Alex Reed, and Jamie Foxx for conducting a weekend sports clinic. So that should have four people in it. So I bet you we, that, that is going to be index. This is negative one. This would be negative two backwards, so that would be inputs negative two. Let's see how it does now with some uh, fed in information. Payer, local sports club, recipient, Sarah Miller, amount 75, weekly. Look at that. It knows to do the four entries. That's awesome. So if you need it to adhere to a certain format, try you know, leveraging like this, this kind of uh, tricking method where you give it, oh yeah, you, you know, here's your system message, but oh, you know that the human said this, and you know the AI said this. Uh, so you're basically tricking it to understand the format you're going for. And this ultimately gives you better for performance when you run a, a new example. So that is pretty dang good. We'll load that in. Oh no, why did that not work? Is there something weird here? Oh, it gave like a... 
Oh, it gave the list, but it didn't return the JSON. That's weird. One additional trick up the sleeve with the Llama2 uh, method, you can also pass in format equals JSON here into the chat llama method, and this will force it to be JSON on the output. So I think that this will help us. And these are the things you just learn <laughs> with frustrating trials and errors in this, this world. Okay, load this. Okay, now we want to get results. And then we can get like the first entry here. Look at that. Then you could get, you know, the recipient. Cool. So this is parsing with Llama 2. And I'm not going to go like, if you want to really like get into this, you could be strict and like try to write some unit tests to text, ch ch I can't speak, to test these things. But really, I just wanted us to, with task number one, to have a sense of how we can do this so that when we approach our documents, we have, you know, a strong uh, grasp of things. A quick little tangent that's worth mentioning. One thing that I really like about Langchain is that it makes it so easy to uh, like switch models. So all I would have to do to switch this to OpenAI is do Langchain OpenAI uh, dot chat, or I don't even think I need to do chat models, but let's see if this works. Chat OpenAI, pass in, let's actually just do another line here so I don't accidentally delete something. Chat open AI. I might have to pass in a key here. Let's see what happens. Actually, I have a key defined already. You would need to pass in the API key if you don't have open AI API key defined in your environment variables because I'm running this locally. I do have that defined. So I think I just run this. And look, let's see. So yeah, th this, all I had to do was change this one line to chat open AI and add this. And now we have <laughs> open AI's um, working of this. And again, you might have to pass in the API key here. If I pass in some dumb value, this is not gonna break, yeah. But uh, it's automatically defined if you have OpenAI API key, all caps in your environment variables list. Feel free to leave a comment if you don't understand how to do that, and I can probably try to provide some help. All right, for task number two, we want to grab apprenticeship agreement rows from our contracts.csv, or contract records, I believe, .csv file. Okay, so this is what we want to do. From this file, we want to grab the apprenticeship agreement subcategory. Feel free, this is a pretty straightforward task. It's kind of the, the warm up task to the actual number, task number two, which is going to be to connect documents that are similar to one another. But we'll start with just grabbing these rows. Feel free to pause the video and resume it when you want to see the solution. All right, so to do this, if you're on the Kaggle world, you can uh, look at our data and note that from the first lines we wrote, um, the contract records are here. So we can go ahead and do df equals pd.readcsv and make sure you have pandas imported. And we can run this and then do something like df.head and we see that we get some rows. And we see actually the first ones are apprenticeship agreements. However, are they all apprenticeship agreements? So we could, to check that, you could do df.subcategory.unique. And I can't spell. 
and we see we have these subcategories. <laughs> One thing we note is what the heck, why is there apprenticeship agreement and apprenticeship agreements? Uh, no matter how much you try to clean data, things like this kind of come through the cr cracks. So if you find yourself in a situation like that and don't know which one to use, I recommend using the value counts method. And we see that apprenticeship agreement, non-plural, has 2405, and apprenticeship agreements has just one. So ideally, we would just change this entry and then resave and upload it to Kaggle. I'm not going to worry about it too much for now. But what we do want is apprenticeship agreement. So I can do, I'm going to call it AA equals DF, DF subcategory equals, 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 and then paste that in, apprenticeship agreement. And then let's uh, run that and do AA.head. See that? And I, I might just do like as a sanity check, like what is the length of the data frame and then what is the length of AA? That looks like the right value of apprenticeship agreements that we saw before, so that looks good. And so what is in this document? What are in these apprenticeship agreements? And if this is all we saw, it's kind of hard to read this transcription text, which is the actual um, contents of these documents. So real quick, I just want to do an aside. If you're developing locally and using Visual Studio Code, do df equals pd. This was just a nice little trick that I realized the other day. Um, sure I have pandas imported. Oh, what am I doing? And in local, it's in data slash, what do we have there? I think it's contract records, yeah. So data slash contract records dot CSV on that. Okay, we have that. And we can do df dot head run that. And again, it's so hard to read this. So one cool trick is if you have a GitHub Copilot installed, uh, I think, I don't know if it's just Copilot or Copilot chat you need. In Jupyter Notebooks within Visual Studio Code, you can do Command I, create a Copilot chat window. And what I recommend doing is you could do something like change pandas display settings to not cut to be unlimited size for displaying, you know, text data in a column when I call df.head. So something along the lines of this in your Copilot chat, it'll give you something like display.max column width, none. And if I run it now, look at how much better this is to read. And I think still it's kind of hard to read these documents because we have these weird characters that pop up everywhere. Um, I'm going to quickly look up what the heck this character is. A carriage return. So. Somehow we got these carriage return characters. So what I would recommend is, it's just a return character, it's not a big deal. If you're seeing this, you might be able to load in the CSV a different way so that you don't see this. But another option for us would have been just to go ahead and do DF like uh, transcription text equals DF transcription text, and it's already giving us an autocomplete, that's kind of nice, string.replace that carriage return character, and instead just have it be a space. Run that. Okay, and now our data is way easier to read. You could, you know, replace other characters too, but now we can actually read through this, and we can do something similar in, in Kaggle land.
just do it here. Okay, I'm gonna rerun this. Look at that, we got rid of the character and now we can read a lot more too. Cool. And so if you wanted to, like we, we got all the rows, we did the task. I guess if you really wanted to, you could add in that uh, other <laughs> row, which was, there's more elegant ways to do this, but. Oh no. These should be surrounded in parentheses if there are multiple conditions. Maybe I have to use the weird syntax like this. Cool, and now if we do length AA, we see we get that other row. So whatever <laughs> solution you want works. So this would be completing task 2A. All right, for task number two, we are going to connect pages from this apprenticeship agreements a data frame that belong to the same document. So what do I mean by this? Let's look back at our documents here. And if we read the text here, and it's hard to read, I'll make it a little bigger maybe, but we see like this one, we see Mrs. Kate Shamblin. And if we look at the next document, we see Mrs. Kate Shambliss. I guess the writing is the name, but like we can assume that this is the same person as this. And is there any other similar names like Betty Taylor? Is this mentioned at all? We see Betty Taylor. So I can assume that this and this are part of the same document. And one thing that's cool is if you actually want to see what these documents look like, you can use the document URL link, go to the Smithsonian website where they live, and we see the actual, this is what's been digitally transcribed to the text that we could actually work with. It would be a lot harder to try to analyze this uh, image here, but we see this, and then if we go to the next page with Kate Chamberlain, we see this, and we see you know the same names. And yeah, this text is so hard to read that like the transcribers here too are going to make mistakes. Like this is a extremely messy data set. So, uh, you know, details like this, they, it happens. But ultimately like this document should be associated with this document. For analysis, we want to group like the same pages together. Maybe they weren't from the exact same document, but like when we're doing our analysis, we probably shouldn't be double counting and treating these as separate things. Ultimately, our goal in the upcoming tasks is to pull out the people that become freed through these agreement of apprenticeships. And we want to do some analysis on their ages, their locations, etc. So we want to group together similar documents. So that's what our goal is in this task. So by the end of this, we want to take rows that are part of the same document that we're considering, merge them together into a single document that has all of the text, and then save that. We can use large language models to help us with this task. So that will be kind of the hint is that we can use either the OpenAI or the Llama 2 um, to help us figure out is, is this the same part, like from the same document as this? So that's kind of the hints. Feel free to try this on your own and then resume the video when you want to see how I would approach it. And to help you out here, one thing that we will do is I recommend it's going to be pretty tough to figure this out probably for the full document to start. So if you want to re have a like reduced version of this document, so we're going to call this AA reduced or AA small or something like that, apprenticeship agreement small. Ideally, honestly, we'd probably have a name that we actually, you know, spelled out fully like this, but I just don't feel like passing that name around everywhere within this analysis. So I'm going to call this AA small, and that's going to be equal to pd.read csv. And I, I guess actually we could just do, um, you know, AA.head, like 
30 or something like that. And now if we look at the length of AA small, it's 30. Another thing we could do is um, if you want to, actually, I'll show it in a sec. So maybe just do it for the first 30 documents because it'll be easier than the full task. All right, feel free to pause the video, resume it when you want to see how I would approach the solution. Okay, so how might we approach this? Well, I think we should, again, given the hint was kind of that we could use our large language models, I think that we want to define another system message. It's going to be equal to something like, your job is to determine whether two pages are from the same document or not. You should determine this by checking if similar checking if similar names, places, dates, etc appear in both documents. If they do return do return only the boolean value true. If they do not return only the Boolean value false. Important, only return a Boolean and nothing else. Okay, now how would we actually package this? Well, if we go back to I guess actually, you know, we could use this format. Uh, I'm going to use Langchain, and we're going to kind of copy what we did previously in the local setup. So we will go and copy this code. Go into Kaggle. And we won't have Langchain yet, so we'll probably have to do pip install Langchain. And probably, I think we could do pip install Langchain and Langchain open AI. I don't know if we have to do both or not, but it doesn't hurt to try. I hope it, I don't know what this error is. I don't like the error. Okay, let's see. We're gonna get rid of this system message. We don't need that anymore. We also don't need this stuff. And our new human message is just gonna be something like document, we'll use an F string here, document one, and then pass in the variable, and then something like new line, new line, new line, document two, and then pass in the variable doc two. I feel like something's off here. Make these imports at the top just for good practice. Uncomment this guy. All right, let's see what happens if we try this.
Okay, so it says we can pass in open AI API key into this. We didn't have to do that locally because it was set as environment variable. This probably helps us. And note, secret value was defined very top of this um, by using secrets within Kaggle. See what happens if we run this again. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we don't have any doc one or doc two captured. We could just do dummy ones for now. So doc one will say is there is a cat named Hugo that was very silly. And then doc two would be Hugo was so silly that he went on a snowboard lift and shredded down the mountain. I am terrible at generating funny little things on the spot. That's why I have ChatGPT, I guess. But these are clearly from the same document, so let's see what it produces. True, look at that, that's pretty cool. And now let's do something like Keith is cool. That should probably say false, it's not really that clear. But look at that. If I do something like, there was also a dog named Jamal. I don't know why the dog's name's Jamal, but shout out Jamal. Jamal was even sillier. Also, clearly from the same, like, these two pages are clear, or I guess I could call them page one, page two, maybe, because they're part of the same document. That's what we're considering it, semantics. Page one, page two. Okay, does it say true for this? No. Uh, if I said something like Hugo and Jamal were friends, I bet you it would. So, you know, there maybe then we would have changed up the system message because it didn't like that we didn't use the word Hugo the second time. But pretty good. Now instead of doing page one and page two and filling this out this way, what we should do is page one should be like a small transcription text zero, and this should be a small transcription text one. And we could print those values out real quick. Print page one, print page two. And let's see what happens. Oh, I might real quick, just so we know what page one and page two is. Also annotate this. So we know clearly when page one ends, page two starts. Okay. And this is what we already saw. Kate Chamblin, uh, Betty Taylor, Mary Taylor. And then page two has some details about this. And we see output. We see the output is true. That looks good. I <laughs> just went, yeah, cool. So it figured out that this was associated with this. Not too bad. And again, we could have kind of used the trick of like providing it some examples to context off of. But what I recommend here now, our task is to connect pages that belong to the same document. We want to do this for every row in AA small. And what I recommend is basically we need a way to identify which are part of the same document. So like you can kind of think of the algorithm, maybe pause the video, try to think of an algorithm on your own. But our goal here is to basically go through our table, check the text, check the next text, see if they are, they correspond to one another. 
if they are, give it, you know, an ID and then check two to three, like row two to row three. If row three is part of row two, you know, give that the same ID as row one, keep going. And then we find that row three is not like row four, then row four kind of starts a new document and we check four to five. If four and five are similar, then we connect them. Note, this table is ordered, so we only need to check like consecutive ones, luckily. Sometimes maybe though, it would be helpful like to check like a couple rows apart because if this is, if row one is clearly part of row two, row two is clearly part of row three, and row four is not clearly part of row three, but row four is clearly part of row one, we'd like that connection. But to simplify things, let's just look one at a time and then basically try to give unique IDs based on what document they will be in the merged output, and then we'll actually do the merging. It's kind of confusing what I'm getting at, but hopefully it makes sense when you see the solution here. Okay, so let's maybe encapsulate this in a function. Def is from same document. We'll pass in page one page two, that's going to run through here, we're going to want to return chat model response dot content. And we might actually want to do AST dot literal eval response.content and we might also want to like surround this with a try and accept in case things fail. LLMs output all sorts of wild stuff so you never really know what it's going to return. And then we'll just have this return false. It's not the end of the world if we don't group documents together, but ideally we group as many as possible together. In the real world, you want to be a little bit, you'd, you definitely want to be stricter here and you'd want to have unit tests. You want, want to make sure that this works exactly as you want it to work. Um, but there's only so much we can cover in this tutorial. Cool. So now we have a function is from same document. Oh, this should not be what this is. Page one and page two are passed in now. Okay, we have this function defined and we can just see if this kind of works is from same document. Hugo is a silly cat. Hugo is a lot of fun. This should produce true. Does. If I said something like Python programming is super cool. That should say false. Cool it does. Um, all right, now we need to iterate through our sample document. And to make sure that your results are similar to, to what produ is produced by my code, we're going to load in a file from the GitHub repo. So the GitHub repo is at github.com slash Keith Galley, slash historical docs analysis. It's in data and it's going to be task to apprenticeship agreement sample. If you click on raw here and then take this URL, we can nicely just load this specific URL. This is a nice little trick into Kaggle. So now we have our test data frame, test DF dot head. And one thing that's nice about this is you can kind of see what we're expecting with this step. Basically, if they have the same expected ID, 
it should be part of the same document. So first and second, as we went through, oh, actually, is this the same? Oh, this is a little bit of a different set, but you see James Connolly here, you see James Connolly, the name here. This th row is now different than this. So we want to get the same expected IDs down here. Basically, you start a new ID each time you're at a new document. So we need to write some code that does that. How could we do it? So we're going to do for index row in df or test df dot iter rows. Did I type this right? Pop up little menu iter rows. There we go. Good old autocomplete. Okay, and I'm just going to do print row. Just want to see what this gives us. This is something I sometimes do, like if index equal, equals five, we'll break. So it's just going to print the five, first five rows real quick. Oh, first five transcription text. Okay, we can access it that way. Um, what happens if I did expected ID? Cool, we get that. So basically we want to add, we're going to basically want to try to add like a merge ID to this table. And basically, at the end of the day, we hope that our merge ID is equal to the expected ID. So I'm going to make a copy of this table real quick. And we'll do test or test df copy, just so we can have the data frame and, and change things without actually affecting what we're iterating over. I don't know if this is necessary or not, but maybe it is. Basically, what we're going to want to do is look at two rows at a time. So we're going to want to look up, the first row will be, maybe I didn't need to do like index row, this syntax, but call this page one equals test df dot loc index and then we want to get the transcription text. Page two is equal to test df dot loc index plus one. And we want to make sure that if index plus one is less than the length of test df. Is that right? I think it's length of okay, so if we had a three item array, one, two, three then the final index would be two because it starts zero, one, two. So three, length three, index plus one. We want to make sure index is one. Yeah, so it has to be strictly less than the length. I think that this is good. We can kind of just skip on the last iteration. Kind of talking to myself right now, but hopefully this makes sense. Okay, that gets our page two. We want to compare them. So, is from, if is from same document, page one, page two, then basically we want to give them the same merge ID. So, I think what we want to do is We're going to set some value called merge ID up here, so zero. If they are from the same document, then test df index merge ID is going to be equal to merge ID and index plus one, the merge ID will be equal to that same merge ID. Right? What if they're not from the same document? Then basically, 
we want to increase the merge ID by one. We want to set only the first item. Okay, this is going to make seconds in a second. And, you know, this, this is not expected to be easy. I've thought about this problem multiple times, so it's a little easier for me this iteration. But a lot of this would be trial and error in the real world, and probably still will be trial and error. But then we want to increase the merge ID plus equals one. So let's think about this logic. First and second document are different, right? We want to set just the first document to have merge ID 0, and then the second document would be merge ID 1. On that first iteration, we look at the first two rows. We see that they're not the same. We're only going to set the first row to 0. Then we increase merge ID plus 1. So now we have a merge ID equals 1. Next iteration, now we're looking at the second and third documents. Let's say that they are the same, then they're both set with merge ID, uh, the same merge ID, which now is one, so they would get one and one. That seems like the logic makes sense. <laughs> Let's see if this code runs. This would be crazy if it works on this, the first go. I should have printed out some stuff to see if. Uh, It's going to take a little while because it has to make a bunch of um, uh, OpenAI calls here feeding into this. We will get a print message if there is an error with any of these calls. So I'm kind of happy that we're not seeing any print messages yet. I'll fast forward through the, this little section. One thing I might have done to just make this more clear is like, I might have printed out the index each time we iterated just so I know where we're at. I always like that when I'm running code because sometimes you realize that it's not getting past the first iteration and there's something seriously wrong. But if you see that index increasing, then it's you're, you, you know you're usually on the right track. Then we can go ahead and check the testdf head down here. I'm a little bit concerned that this did not complete. Come on. All right, it doesn't appear to be running. I'm going to give it one more minute. This is why you should be printing out index. Doesn't appear to be running. And I think one thing, I'm going to stop this. This is why we should be printing as we go. Um, one thing I recommend is if you're using Langchain in the invoke function, we can pass in a timeout. I'm going to give that 20 seconds. We might have been just spinning and spinning trying to make a call and it never worked. So at least we'll see an error if this timeout is hit. Rerun this function, rerun this load, and then also, let's see, I think that this should be outside of this if statement. And we should print out definitely like our index. Processing index index and we can make this an f string index of length okay i think one of either this timeout variable that we added or this printing, I think, should help us see what how it's doing. Okay, that's, that's going so quick. <laughs> Why was it spinning for years? I don't know what it got caught in. But yeah, visualizing things like this is helpful. I don't know if it lost internet connection or something. Okay. I think it's on the last one, but I guess it's on the last one. It doesn't have a call to make, index plus. Is it running into some error? Is it still spinning? Oh, it ran. OK. Oh, the last one, I guess the, it should have been 
of length minus one because the index only goes to 26. Okay, let's see what happens. Did it give us that merge ID? Oh, sweet. Oh, no. Okay, so we have some issues here. We expected these to be the same. Let's try to see more of our document. And one thing that might be, yeah, actually, this is still good. Why did I just do five? I meant 50. Does it ever have the same merge ID? I don't think it does. Are we ever getting inside this? Let's see. Print here. Oh, interesting. This is going to reset it no matter what, how we put this. So we should be continuing if we hit this case and going back to the top of the loop, not executing this code. That might have do the trick. So it was basically doing this, probably was getting inside this function, but then it was resetting the current index to be the merge ID, adding one, and then you know, basically doing it, the plus one one would set the merge ID for the next row. And I think we just basically got, yeah, just consecutive values. It's, hopefully that made sense, kind of made sense. It's taking a sec, it's taking a sec. See, it's, it, these models sometimes are weird. So I like the timeout because at least it will give us an output if it struggles or something, but it looks like it's gone through now. I'm seeing here a little too frequently, though. Don't think we should see it on every call. Like this should not be the same as this. I'm going to say if the same names. OK, run this, run this, run this, run this. Why does it keep getting in? Why does every document say it's from the same document? At least we got some variance here. Hmm. This is very weird. This is the type of thing where maybe we pass in some samples of valid inputs and outputs. I'm going to do that here. We'll try this. I ideally shouldn't be referencing a data frame directly in this, but I'm just going to do it for testing and we can clean it up later. This is actually, I think, from a different sample than our actual data. Okay, so this is going to be page one. Example, page two, example, and if we look at a small, we see Kate Chamblin, Kate Chamblin here. So this is definitely true. So this should be a AI message, and it's just going to be true. 
Let's probably find one that's false though too. Still the same, still the same. This looks different, so three and four indexes, three and four are different. Copy this. Just giving it a, just testing this. I'll fix up the naming. So this should be false. So this is example one, example two, and this should be false. Let's see if this improves performance at all. I'm liking that this is not connecting as many together. We'll see. Zero, zero. One, one, two, two, three. Oh, no. This was close. It thought that these were different. I bet you if I added like one more example. So you can like, you know, train it with some, or like give it some Additional context. Let's see how that works. <sighs> All right, let's see how our expected IDs compare. Sweet, sweet, good, good. No, it's, it's struggling on this one. This is so clearly a continuation of this, like maybe if I just give it like another clear indicator is if the first few words in page two are a continuation of the last few words on page one. Let's see if that fixes things. Doing this in real time. Cross our fingers. And note, there's infinite ways to do this. What I'm showing is definitely not the only way, but this is how you have to approach this. You gotta iterate, you gotta you, you know, be creative. You gotta figure out what edge cases it's not hitting on. Zero, zero, one, one, two, two. Three, oh no, why is it struggling so much? Did I rerun this? Maybe I didn't rerun the... Oh my gosh. I don't know what's the deal. This was one approach. You know, you could try a different approach here. Uh, I want to change this language. One of the key ways to determine this is by checking if the same names, places, I'm going to call this locations, dates appear in both, maybe I should say pages. Yeah, pages, that might be better. The input format 
it will be user message passing in page one, page one content. New line, new line, new line, page two, page two content. Uh, another thing we could try here is there's this text wrap library. I don't think that this will help, but it's a good trick to know. Uh, I bet you'll have to pip install text wrap. Uh, I don't know if this will work. Is text wrap part of this? Oh wow. There's this text wrap dedent function you can try that um, sometimes helps because sometimes the indented text is not great for your performance. So we tried a couple different things. Let's see if this helps us at all. Zero, zero, one, one, two, two, two. Uh, it got one more. I got. Oh, wait. Oh, sweet. This expected ID might be off. Orphan Jane. Uh, is this a different Orphan Jane? I uh, know. It's still. Other than that, it did pretty good. And. Like, it's only missing one right now. It's only not hitting. This value right here. Wait. I was the one that labeled these expected IDs. So it's possible I'm off too. Like, I think as long as you're close enough, that's pretty good. Ideally, you know, if you have more time, you want to be more and more precise. But I don't want to spend too much, too much time getting this. We're pretty close to having a good thing. So I'm going to just kind of continue onward. I'll put resources to other ways I went about solving some of these problems in the past. Just to share one quickly. When I was trying this task before the video, I went with this to find this from same document function that also had some like retry logic in it. But it basically uses this prompt template syntax that is a bit different than the way that we did it with um, system message and whatnot. It's like the system message, I feel pretty much the user, uh, like you only ever see this, the system message is only ever used and it's just invoked on just this with the documents directly inserted instead of trying to use like the AI or like the AI messages and the user messages. And then uh, some of the additional libraries are inputted up here. So yeah, this was another approach to this. Try to get it close enough. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Cool. All right, now finally, once we have these merge IDs in this document, we actually need to go ahead and merge them and you know remove the duplicate rows and merge similar documents. So to do that, we could call, let's look up our document again. Basically, we want to group by the merge ID, or you can do expected ID if you really want to. They're pretty dang close. Sorry, pass the merge. It should be group by merge ID. And then basically, we want to aggregate those grouped by rows. So we'll take the transcription text from each grouped by merge ID. 
we're going to call this dot ag function and we want to join these similar pages with new line characters and we'll do dot join this is kind of some special syntax and then we can reset the index what does that give us okay cool so these are the merged documents they're longer if you wanted to you could add like two new lines to maybe make it more clear what's been appended on. Oh, I guess it's not showing the, if we did display, I think maybe it would work. Or if we did print, I guess print this, I think you'd see the new line characters. Yeah, oh, maybe not. I don't know why it's not showing the new lines. Okay. And then we basically want to get this back onto our original data frame. So what we could do is we could do our original. Let's set this to aggregated equals this. Test DF equals test. I'll call this output DF equals test DF Drop, drop duplicates, and we want to drop any duplicate merge IDs. Any duplicates with merge IDs. Uh, I guess though the UR document URL is no longer valid either. We just want to keep the category and subcategory. Okay, we'll do this. Uh, drop duplicates, then we want to basically merge them together so we can do output df equals pd.merge output df with the aggregated df on will be merge id how do we need to do how we want to keep the stuff in the output data frame so how equals left uh, anything else you need to do? Then because they're going to both have this transcription text column, we should add suffixes. Don't need a suffix for the output DF, but we should have aggregated appended onto the new one. Let's see what output data frame looks like after this. Output df. Cool. Looks good. Now we can drop a bunch of these. So we can realistically final df equals output df dot drop. I'm going to drop project. I, project ID should be the same. So, so we just want to drop document URL. Uh, maybe we want the URL. Because <laughs> yes, it's not going to be necessarily the same, but at least you could rep find a document that's nearby the other ones. So I think that this is probably good enough. We do, we do want to drop, though, uh, the, the original transcription text. That'll be confusing if we keep that. So. Final DF dot head. Cool. All right, these are merged documents. And I know this wasn't perfect, but at least it gives you a sense. Ultimately, in this process, we want to like to do analysis, we want to have all the similar pages together so that we can analyze those one at a time. There's other strategies to go about it, but this is helpful in various document categories here. So I think it's worth seeing. Uh, at this point, we should run this for all of the rows in our original apprenticeship agreements data frame, but because that's going to take a really long time, uh, for simplicity's sake, I just 
put a pretty good output version of that um, in the GitHub repo. So you can go to github.com slash historical docs analysis, and then it is specifically data, and then it is um, merged apprenticeship agreements. And it's in here, so if you copy this URL, then we go to Kaggle, we can go to task number four, number three, which is going to be parse out values from merged documents. And we're going to get a data frame, which is going to be pd.read csv, that link there. So this is like the full version, just so you don't have to run it on every single one. But you would have run that chat command on everything to get to this point. All right, we're already pretty <laughs> far into this video. So to, I think make things a bit simpler. I will have Kaggle all available for you all, and I encourage you to push things on Kaggle because I want to see your res research finding. I would love to see how you analyze these docs. But um, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to just, um, I think, play around with the rest on Visual Studio Code. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. OK, so we want to get the apprenticeship details from these documents. So if we look at the documents, we have this aggregated text. And honestly, I might like, how do I display these new lines actually showing up in the doc? Let's see if uh, command I helps me here. That didn't work. Yeah, whatever. Not the end of the world. But basically, what we want to grab is we want to grab information like who the apprentice is, so their name. So in this case, it would be probably like Minor Orphans Freed, James. James, same net. You might want to grab apprentice age, which in this case, do we see James's age? 14. Uh, we might want to grab like the location of this. So Carroll Parish, Louisiana. So county, you want to go to the state. And these are American states, so I realize that LA is Louisiana. That might not be immediately clear to non-US residents here. Uh, that would be Louisiana. I might also want what we'll call like the apprentice I don't know what you would call that. Mentor is, I think, how we've listed it previously. So you have the apprentice and the mentor. So in this case, it would be Mrs. Kate Chamblin. And this is weird because, like, the, you know, the, her name is listed different ways, different times. So, like, I think that this spelling is probably more correct. Um, cool. Maybe like an official or something like that. But I think that this is a good starting point. 
And basically, yeah, so this format you see here, it should strike you very similarly to what we did at the start of this video, where we, you know, use a format like this. So I think what we want to do is copy this. Actually, maybe copy all of this code. Copy all of this code, go down here. Create a new cell, paste that code in, and now we want to grab different stuff. So we want to grab apprentice name, uh, apprentice age. We don't need quotes here because it's an age. It should be a number. So we can do uh, we want mentor. I guess we should probably say mentor name. How do we call it before? Call it mentor name. And we'll say name of person taking in the apprentice. Mentor. That should be in strings. We want county. the county, the contract, county where the contract was made, state, the state where the contract was made, and one thing we might want to do here is like we saw LA before and we know that that should be Louisiana. So we might want to explicitly say make sh like write out full state, not just abbreviation. Okay, that's good. Grab information about apprenticeship agreement contracts. Your job is to parse out information about apprenticeship agreement contracts in the United States. I'll put the following JSON object. Note if there are multiple people, multiple apprentices in a single document, create a dictionary item entry for each one in the results list. There we go, decent. Let's see how this works. We can just take a snippet from one of these. Okay, let's see what happens here if we just pass this input text. I'll probably use the three quotes to make it easier. Okay, and our LLM will be chat open AI. Let's see what it produces here. We screwed something up. Input text. Why did it? Oh man. That is pretty good right from the get go. So, how did we get the results before?
did response dict json loads and so note for context the reason this is important to us is because if we produce a ton of these JSONs, then we can analyze. We can analyze these ages. We can see what's in the documents. We're pulling out this concrete information and we're making it actionable. So that's like quite, quite cool. Um, so we need to Oh, I just want to show me the results. Let's get item zero, apprentice age. 14, perfect. OK, we're processing this. Now we need to run it for multiple things. How would we do that? We have this DF. We're passing in input text. So what we're going to want to do is I and I don't think we're going to want to go through the whole data frame. So I'm going to say df small equals df dot head like the first I don't know 50 documents for I index row and df small dot We probably want to make this a function now. So def get output. I'm trying to think if we are doing this for each, we should ultimately probably store like the JSON in a new data frame or in this DF small, because then we can just process it all together. So what we're going to do is we're going to, what's in our DF, DF again? We want to use this column. So we're going to do for index row in df small dot iter rows. We want to grab our input text is equal to row transcription text aggregated. Okay, we want to feed that into our function here. Oh no. Output is equal to get output input text, and then we want to ultimately output JSON equals the output. And I recommend timeout equals 20. I recommend probably using a try catch here just in case things fail. I feel like oftentimes things fail in LLM world. So it So we're doing, uh, we'll just do return none if this is the case. You could also add in retries or something, but uh, we'll just use none for now. And I think it's always good to print the index we're at as we iterate through this. Sometimes you might need to do a time.sleep to not hit your rate limits too, but I think we should be good. Let's see what happens here. And we'll add a new code cell below this. Oh, 
Oh, I guess we did df.head. We probably should have made df.head.copy here. So we didn't actually affect the original data frame at all. And I'm just doing df small because uh, it will take a long time to run this on all, but if you have the time to spare, you can run it on all, all rows. Let's just start this from scratch. And I want to add a row below. Look at that. OK, it ran on those 50. And we see we have this output JSON um, in our uh, data frame. Cool. Uh, because we only ran it for, yeah, those 50. If you wanted to see what an example output for um, a, a larger chunk of the data set, pretty much all of those apprenticeship agreements, you can go to the GitHub. Tasks for raw, and you can take that. I will say that, again, try to do all of this computation in a really short time span. So most of the work in like doing a research project like this, I feel like, is spent actually double checking, uh, triple checking the values that you produce in these stages. That's where a lot of real effort needs to go into, and that's what the time-consuming effort is. So I think with that in mind, note that like you know some of these values won't be perfect, but hopefully this process in general you'll understand, and you can take this and be more specific, more exact as you move forward with building upon this knowledge. So anyway, there's this task four. We're going to use that for our analysis step. Um, I'll just paste that in here. But real quick, yeah, when I mean, we have these output parsed JSON outputs, that's pretty cool. And what could we do with them? Well, let's, yeah, we'll do that in the analyze results stage. Cool. Sweet. All righty. So the final task is to analyze our results. So I'll also actually save this DF small. So you can reference reference this too. Uh, we'll just call this like task for parsed small dot csv. Um, so that will also be in GitHub. I'll add that uh, in a bit. But we have this, you know, df small here that has these output JSONs. And honestly, just to make things simpler for us, I might just, let's just get the output JSON column. OK, cool. And what we can do is we could do something like, um, Info list equals blank. We could do for index row, df small iterate rows. I don't like doing just this. I, I want to get the individual lists here and add those individual objects because I think that's what's going to be easiest to output into something meaningful. So I think we want to first um, results list. I guess first we have to um, uh, output dict equals json.loads that results list equals output dict results. And then we basically want to, for result and results list, add that to our info list. And I would say, like, we'll try this for each thing. Uh, except exception as e print e all this stuff you never know if it's going to be perfectly formatted so 
it's always good to use the try except so we don't break. But let's see what happens if we run this. Now look at our info list. Let's get like the first item. Perfect. That looks very easy to parse. Three. Perfect. So I'd say that the task here is from our DF small, let's get the average age of apprentices. Let's see how we would analyze that. Feel free to pause the video and resume when you want to see how I would approach it. Okay. okay, this is an example like for loop we could get the average age. And we should expect it to be somewhere between 0 and 21. So let's see what we actually get. What did I do wrong? What is the average age? Ten. Ten years old exactly, it says here. I wonder... I just get nervous when I see such a perfect number. <laughs> what did I do? Okay, it seems like it's, it's actually ten. Um, okay, that would be like average age. Cool. We could make this more interesting though and do like age counts equals empty dictionary. We get the age uh, if it's an instance of an int. If age and age counts, we plus equals one, else we set it. And now we run that and we run age counts. Uh, this seems a little too perfect. That doesn't seem right. Let's about look back at our info list. A ton of people in here. It looks like maybe it repeated stuff way too much. Yeah, it looks like the output is not actually what we wanted it to be. Dang. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oops. I realized that input this was had input text in it, and there's input text right here. So just need to make sure we delete this <laughs> uh, so that it runs uh, properly. So let's rerun this. Awesome, we got 50 there. Uh, we'll go ahead and save this too. We'll call this task for 
um, parsed small dot csv index equals false run that and okay Alrighty, for task four, we will actually analyze our results. And again, like we went quickly through this, so we didn't do all the testing checks that we should ideally do. So if you're to do this in a more involved project, if you wanted this to be more of a portfolio type project, I recommend really testing the values along the way and seeing if you're getting the right outputs. I recommend writing like some unit tests to kind of like see if for let's say 25 examples, you always parse the correct output. And then if you do that for like 25 examples, you'd be pretty confident applying it to the rest. It's not perfect right now what we have, but um, really this is to showcase what process you can use to do this type of analysis. So to analyze results, let's just start with the small document. So you can grab it by doing, um, uh, I'll have it saved as this on GitHub. So similar to how you've grabbed other GitHub documents, you can just fill in the name right here on this URL. Um, so you go to, I haven't pushed it yet, so I'll have to push it. But we have our DF small, and we want to just specifically, let's just look at the um, output JSON column here. And we see we have a bunch of, you know, apprentice information here. So I think the first thing is, let, let's set the concrete task of, we want to find the average age in this DF small output JSON uh, list of 50 things. So find the average age of apprentices. So how could we go about doing that? Well, I think we want to get it into an easier format to work with. So I think the first thing we'll want to do is kind of iterate through all of our rows and just add the actual individual dictionary objects into this info list. I think that will be easier to process. So we're gonna do, um, we wanna first load it in as a dictionary. So we'll call this uh, output dict equals JSON loads the JSON. So now we have it in Python form call this results list equals the results object within that. Cool. So then we want to go iterate through the items in that list. Okay. And then let's see what's in our info list. Hopefully that works. Oh no. Okay, I would just say we can always just try doing this. If it doesn't work, we'll just do nothing to our info list. We'll just do accept, exception as e print e. Okay, we got a few errors, but I think we should probably have enough in our info list to get a rough average age. Uh, we'll just grab the zeroth element. Cool. We have nice age there. So I'm gonna do average age equals zero. For info and info list, and we should probably always do a dot get, dot get, apprentice age. And I don't wanna do a get zero. I would say if this value is not there, or it's like a none or something, I'd say our first check should be age equals info dot get if is instance age of int. I like how these autocomplete is just helping me get along there. Um, average age plus equals info dot get. And then we'll also do count plus equals one. Count equals zero. And now we want to print 
Perfect. Let's see what we get. 12.453125. That seems reasonable. We know that like most of these apprentices end at age um, 21. So it seems like 12 would be a reasonable value. So that is the average age from the DF small. Another interesting thing I think to do would be like age counts and make this a dict. Um, we could do, okay, probably the same here. Uh, then we would do something like that. Like how AutoCAD it just knows what I want to do. Uh, now let's look at age counts. Look at that. From our 50, this is what we get for counts. Uh, maybe be interesting to histogram that. And I'm going to use Copilot to help me here. Um, from a dictionary mapping values to the count of those, those values, make a histogram of that information. And so in this case, our data we already have, that's age counts. So I'm going to just set data equals age counts. Let's see if this, wow. Do we have a bunch of 18 year olds? Yeah, 12, wow. Here's a histogram of that information, cool. Um, I think what might be interesting though is maybe instead of df small, let's load in df equals pd.readcsv. We'll get the full spreadsheet, which if you go to GitHub, github.com slash youthgalley data. Um, parsed apprenticeship agreements. This should give us like a full thing. Go to raw, get this link. Cool. Go back here. We'll paste this in. We'll call this like uh, I'll call it just DF. <laughs> Why not? Uh, does this load? Cool. Now I'm going to make a big info list. Actually, let's just real quick look at what's in that DF. What is the output JSON here? Or do we have a different name or something? It's called output JSON. OK, results. OK, I think that's probably good. Let's see what's in the info list. OK, it's still got things. Oh, we added an additional field official here. Uh, let's see what happens with these age counts. Very different. We got a lot more values. And we got a nice histogram here. Is there really an 80-year-old? This doesn't seem right. <laughs> but interestingly enough, Let's uh, maybe drop any data that's dot drop. I'm kind of cheating here. Maybe there's multi, you know, older apprentices, but I don't think there would be an 80-year-old apprentice. I feel like that seems off. Er. That seems like a more reasonable histogram. So that's like in all of our uh, apprenticeship agreements, this is the rough histogram. Might not be perfect because we didn't double check this. Um, but I think interestingly enough, we could go to the Freedman Bureau's website. So we're kind of tying this together. And we can go into categories. We could go into dentures of apprenticeship. 
and we can see what we get here. So this was just from like a you know slide presentation at some point. Um, this is like a rough Prentice histogram distribution. So ours looks a bit different. Uh, this is why you double check things. Uh, I'm thinking that maybe this is counting nuns or something here, or maybe the code that we have right now, it's not been tested a ton, so maybe it's not properly parsing tables. But it is nice that generally, you know, we see the, a fairly similar trend with the rest of our data, you know, kind of a normal-ish distribution, which I think makes sense. You know, you're not going to have many zero-year-old apprentices, and once you get to close to 21, probably like, you know, don't, not as common. Other things we can look at is like in here is like the people with the highest number of apprentices. It would be interesting to also analyze this. So how would we get this in our code? So what we might do is we could just do this down below. So let's get, we'll copy this code. Now instead of age counts, we'll do call it like mentor counts. Info to get mentor. 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 No longer does this have to be an instance of that. Shift tab. No longer does this need to be greater than 25. If mentor in mentor counts, then we want to output mentor counts. I might just do a quick iteration. Let's see. Oh, it didn't work. We call it mentor, right? Mentor, okay, what did I do wrong here? For info and info list, mentor equals info.getMentor. If mentor in mentor counts, oh, this is, doesn't work. Oh, okay, else, oh, I'm modifying the wrong dictionary. Cool. And then we could do something like for value I'm going to just do like if value is less than 15 or like less than 10 how about like I want to see who's the highest numbers in here. We could do mentor counts dot pop key. All right, we're making a copy just so it doesn't give us this error. Run this. And then let's make another histogram. This is now mentor counts. Okay, so here's some names. And these are things to check. One we see is James Connolly. 
And so I think one thing that's interesting is if we look at our the website, you see James Connolly, he was the biggest there. I think other things to notice is like, hmm, why, um, you know, H.H. Foster appears a ton, but I don't see him on the actual uh, website count, which is surprising. Well, if we look into the data real quick, If we look at the data real quick, and we look up the name H. H. Foster, we're gonna wrap this. H. H. Foster. Uh, okay, it looks like it appears here. Let's try again. H. H. Foster. Where is H. H. Foster? Okay. Basically, we can see right here is a good example that H. H. Foster is a assistant superintendent bureau of the Freedmen's Bureau. Yeah, you know, uh, refugees, abandoned lands, etc. Yeah. H. H. Foster's, so this person, in the way that they're being classified in this document here, that person should be considered an official, not a mentor. That's why they're getting mistakenly counted in this when we see in the results, uh, the actual Freedman Bureau results on the website, they weren't appearing. So there's a lot of checks that need to be done to make this right. So I really encourage you, if you want to take this to the next step, is to iterate on this and try to really validate that your outputs are what you're expecting. But I'm hoping that through this process, it was a very long process, but I'm hoping that you have a sense of, okay, so what did we do here? We had a bunch of documents. We connected the documents together if they, the pages seemed very related to one another. So now we have a bigger document. From those bigger documents, we wanted to pull out specific names and entities because pulling out specific details like that are much easier to analyze than a big chunk of text. So we pulled out apprentice names. We pulled out their mentor names. We pulled out their ages. Well, now we have a massive list of these um, you know, dictionary type objects and that makes it way easier. We can iterate through those dictionary objects and you know, calculate the average age, calculate a histogram of ages, calculate the names that appear most frequently. And that's how we can get some insights on uh, you know, key people figures, key you know, ways that these things were approached at that time period. So hopefully this process makes sense. I would love if people take this to the next step, keep at it, like contribute uh, notebooks to Kaggle, find some cool information from the research, even if it's just finding unique stories within the data. Would love to see that in Kaggle. Really encourage you to do that. Maybe we can do some like live stream Kaggle sessions or something or live stream reviews of notebooks that you post on Kaggle. Would be totally down to like build off of this. Uh, let me know ideas in the comments. But I think with that, we'll call it. <laughs> Very, a lot of real world skills in this video. This was a real you know, data science project that I worked on. So hopefully you enjoyed seeing that. Uh, I want to say thank you to the entire Freedmen's Bureau team that helped out on this. It was a really interesting project to work on and it's cool what can be done with these large language models. Hopefully you learned a lot in this video. If you did, make sure to throw the video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't. But more tutorials coming. Until next time, everyone. Peace.